Good afternoon and welcome to this Euronews special live inside the European Parliament. This year has been a year like none other. The coronavirus crisis has upended all of our lives and we faced greater and greater restrictions on our freedoms. Europe's solidarity indeed has been tested. Politicians are frankly struggling to cope with the challenge. The full economic impact has yet to be properly felt. And so now in the midst of this second coronavirus crisis wave, what more can politicians do to save people's lives and indeed the livelihoods? And what lessons and changes will this pandemic make to Europe's long-term health systems? Well, I'm delighted to say we've got a vast and great array of guests uh, joining us here in the Parliament and indeed remotely. Let me introduce who they are. First up, we've got uh, Christian Bujoy. He is a Romanian EPP MEP. Uh, next to him is uh, Sara Shadesh. She is a, a, an SND Portuguese uh, um, MEP. Then joining us down the line, we've got Michele Calabro from the European Patients Forum. Uh, Thomas Slav is uh, a so called, sorry, uh, is from the EPP. He's a Croatian MEP. And Thomas Alvin, who is from the European Federation of Pharmaceuticals Industries and Associations, is also joining us down the line. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, for joining us uh, today. Just to let you know, of course, uh, this is all in conjunction with Euronews' launch of The Briefing. Uh, it is a new newsletter that is going to go out weekly at 6pm on Thursdays. Uh, I'm going to be writing about this very debate in tomorrow's issue. We'll have more thoughts on that. And also we're going to bring you some of the insights and the big stories facing uh, Europe every single week. And indeed, uh, looking at some of the best bits of Euronews' coverage uh, throughout the week. You can sign up on euronews.com to the briefing newsletter. I would encourage you uh, to do so. Let's start, though, uh, by getting into what we're here to talk about, which is uh, the coronavirus crisis. There is no doubt that much of Europe is involved in a pretty substantial second wave. Uh, there's hardly any part of Europe that has not been affected by this. Uh, and the question, I suppose, is have we learned any of the lessons for the first time round and how bad could this autumn and winter get? Christian, let's first of all go to you. How bad do you think things are going to get this autumn and winter? Nobody knows, but uh, hopefully, I, I hope, not so bad. It's clear that we have a second wave, uh, and now we have also the autumn and the winter season, uh, the normal flu, so things could uh, be even more complicated than in the summer or in the spring. But uh, some lessons should be learned. And uh, I think, uh, first of all, citizens knows better how to protect themselves. We are already, uh, we have already measures and uh, people are more open uh, and uh, they will follow more closely the recommendations, at least is what I hope. And of course, uh, we mobilize already a lot of money in order to help uh, member states, to help uh, ministers of health, to help hospitals to, to, to manage better the situations. And I'm talking about the emergency funds. And of course, for the near future, we'll have uh, another fund. This is what uh, we voted today, the EU for Health program. Uh, I'm the rapporteur and we have also here the socialist representative, my colleague Sara, and other colleagues which worked on this. Uh, for the near future and for the medium term, we'll also be better prepared. But for now, I hope that we have all the ingredients to fight uh, more effectively at the beginning. But of course, uh, the situation is not good at all. Sara, to you, though, many would say, actually, we made mistakes this summer. We encouraged people to travel. We encouraged, in some ways, life to try and get back to normal. And that might have actually provoked this, this second wave. <laughs> That's a, a bit of a sword with two points. Um, first of all, we, we tried to reach a new normal. We are not getting back at, as what we were before, because uh, for that to happen, we need... Uh, for this virus to be eliminated or reduced, and for that only with herd immunity, treatment, or for the virus to lose its uh, viral balance and to disappear and not infect more the humans. We're very far from any of those hypotheses. The best one we have in the table now is vaccinations. What we have now is that this new normal that was incentivized is important, but needs to be very well streamlined with measures on how to protect ourselves and how to have safety measures. And this is something that now we are in the verge of 
or at the beginning of a second wave. We don't know how big it is. As Christian mentioned, we're going to have the flu season, upper respiratory tract infections, and these all will contribute for more cases of COVID-19. But what we have now is that people and citizens are a bit fed up with these measures. And we need to have a stronger effort, we as a politicians, you from the media, the scientists, how to communicate better the importance of these measures. And we have le lessons to learn from the last big pandemic with such magnitude in the world, which was 1918, when the second wave was so, so massive when compared to the first. And this is something that we need to tackle. Yeah, indeed, during that um, the so-called Spanish flu, of course, more people died uh, during the second wave than they did in the first. Uh, Thomas Lav, I'll, I'll come to you on that point, though, that Sarah was bringing up, quite an astute one about fatigue. Uh, that, you know, people accepted the lockdown first time. They, you know, there was genuine concern about the virus. But you get the sense in some parts of Europe, people have just had enough. Uh, they, they want to get back to normal and they don't want to face another winter of lockdowns. Yes, that's true. I, uh, I have to say that in the beginning, we didn't know a lot about the new, the new virus. So to, to the lockdown was something logical. So it was a logical step at, at this stage. Of course, uh, there were a lot of economic uh, consequences of the, of the lockdown. For instance, in my country, in Croatia, our level of public debt has gone up from 71% to 85% of the GDP just for this because of these two months of, of restrictions. So I think definitely that a new lockdown is not real. I, I believe that the consequences of a new lockdown in terms of econo economic consequences, in terms of uh, it, consequences of, on the whole uh, healthcare system, be, uh, which... <laughs> Definitely, which, which would definitely become a big, a big problem if it happens. I mean, because if you don't, if you, if the if the there is no money in the state budget, you cannot finance healthcare system, you cannot finance doctors, you cannot uh, purchase medical equipment, etc. So I believe there will be no lockdown. But this is why it is especially important that uh, all the measures that are and restrictions that are in place now are being respected by the people. That we have to put up with them, unfortunately, because if we do not do this, then we'll have a, an upward spiral and then we'll have to, an ad, we'll have to for the second time, think of, about the lockdown. Uh, lockdown. So uh, uh, so be, be responsible now, be disciplined now, and th this is the only way to prevent a possible future lockdown. OK, well, on that point about lockdowns, I actually spoke uh, yesterday uh, to uh, Thomas Kluge. He is the, oh, sorry, Hans Kluge, sorry. he's the regional director for the WHO here in Europe. And I began by asking him about how bad he thinks, from his assessment, uh, this autumn and winter could be for Europeans. We see that the number of new cases daily are two to three times higher than the peak in April. However, the average mortality is seven times lower and what we call the doubling time in admissions to the hospital is three times longer. And we see that's because the transmission among the elderly population is lower. It's mainly in the younger age cohorts, which has to do with hypermobility and unprotected contact. So in that sense, is there a reason for panic? I would say no. Is there a reason for concern? Absolutely. The clock is ticking and the key challenge is the pandemic fatigue that in some countries up to 60% of the people are really tired of the restrictive measures. Today in October is not the same as yesterday in March. We became smarter in targeting the virus instead of targeting the economy, targeting the people. And that in fact links to the question, is Europe going to see another continent-wide lockdown or not? No. The vision of WHO is a lockdown is really a last resort. In many countries, we saw that the test track trace capacity tremendously scaled up and that countries are now more able to have locally temporary lockdowns instead of nationwide. If, however, the politicians would consider a lockdown, then again in March, this was based on COVID data. Now we have to base it on two kinds of data, COVID, but also what I call collateral damage. Are there mitigation strategies on mental health, gender-based sexual domestic violence, school closure, 
Are there solutions for children with special disabilities for which digital solutions may not work? We have to avoid the catastrophe in the elderly homes and especially inequities. If there's one thing we learned, is that the COVID targeted already the most vulnerable of society. So the microeconomic support by the governments is key. Hans Kluge there from uh, the World Health Organization speaking to me a little bit earlier. So that's a really interesting point from his, is this idea about locking down again. He's making the point that it should only ever be a last resort because of all the other complications that that, that that leads to. But for lots of governments, it seems to be just round the corner. Sarah. Oh, it's for me, sorry. Uh, yes, indeed, it should be only as a last resort. There's many, many other measures that governments can put in place in order to manage better the outbreak and the disease itself and the spread of the virus whilst protecting the most vulnerable. For that, there needs to be fund, but also funds, but also political will, because it's important to have this uh, balance between the measures, but also what we were talking before about the fatigue of the citizens. If we go to lockdown again, there, there can be a rebound effect that citizens won't comply better when everything opens again and then we will have a serious tremendous third wave that can be quite unsettling. Um, Christian, just on that point, just before we go to a poll that we're going to bring in in a second, I mean, do you think politicians at the moment or governments are getting the balance right between trying to protect lives and livelihoods, people's jobs? I think the balance is right for the moment, at least in most of European countries. And uh, uh, of course, uh, it is, uh, you, you cannot find the perfect solution. Uh, until now, uh, the situation was managed. Of course, we have many casualties, but you know the scenarios could be more ap apocalyptic. And uh, uh, in many member states, uh, the situation was managed in hospitals and a lot of lives were saved. Also, a lot of lives were saved because uh, uh, some restrictions were imposed and because people respected the recommendation. It's not easy for anyone. It's essentially to, to keep this balance. Also to think to the economies, to think to jobs, to think to our envir environment, economic environment, social environment, because this also will, could, uh, uh, could open uh, very difficult situations in the near future. Let's hope we'll not go in a very chaotic scenario and we'll stay in a balance. And until now, this balance was clear. OK. Um Thomas Lav, I'm just going to bring you in one second, but we're just going to pause there for one second because I'm going to bring in an opinion poll. We've been asking you across Europe what you think, uh, and we've asked you in respect to the timeline of the coronavirus pandemic, how do you feel? Uh, this is in Germany, Italy, France, and the UK at this moment in time. And as you can see pretty dramatically, uh, most people in most countries uh, think that the worst is yet to come. 51% there in Germany, 41% in Italy, 55% in France and 55% in the UK. Um, you know, well ahead, of course, of people who think that the worst is uh, behind them. Uh, Thomas Lav, you wanted to come in on this. And, and don't forget, sorry, by the way, on these polls, we're going to have all these details in the briefing uh, when it's published tomorrow. Euronews.com, if you want to sign up. Sorry, Thomas, I yeah. you wanted to come in on this idea about getting the balance right. Yes, I think one of the reasons why we had problems, especially in the beginning on the European level, is that uh, since healthcare is primary and national competence, that each member state had its own policy, its own criteria about uh, which restrictions to impose, which limitations on travel and economic activity, etc. And this has created a lot of problems, especially in terms of mobility of goods, of services, of people across borders, etc. So I think it is very important that the Council has uh, recently adopted the new, new recommendations recommendations which kind of set common standards in terms of uh, different regions and, and the level of the pandemic that they are in. Because I think that is important in terms of coordinating uh, epidemiological policies by the member states, in terms of being, being able to compare situation in different member states, but not just in different member states, but in different regions. Because you know that in, in, in one member state you can have completely different situations in different parts of this, of, of this country. And this regional approach that you look at every region specifically, that each region can adapt its own measures to the situation 
situation is very important. But this also shows that definitely what we need more and what this uh, pandemic has shown us that we need more common European policy, common European solutions and common European coordination. Because you know that according to the subsidiarity principle, European Union steps in when member states cannot resolve some problem, a problem by themselves. Okay. And we can see that this is a, a very good example of, su of such a situation. Well, just on that very point, we're going to move on now back uh, to Hans Kluge from the WHO because I picked up on that point about Europe cooperating more when it came to healthcare, whether that was possible or not, and indeed how it can do so. And this is what he had to say. seconds um maybe not um anyway let's pause at that moment um and hopefully we'll we'll get that clip up for you uh, at the moment let's bring in michaeli calabro who is from the european patients forum he is uh, down the line uh, for us this afternoon and uh, michaeli thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, just on that sense do you feel that you obviously represent patients across europe do you think that europe has managed to unite on this issue of healthcare over the last six, seven months. And what are the expectations of patients going forwards? Hello, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Now I can see myself. So, um, yeah, indeed, uh, uh, also from, from the patient perspective, uh, first of all, thanks, thanks everyone for, for having EPF represented by me here today. Um, from, from the patient point of view, I think that indeed uh, it, it Europe has managed to advance quite uh, quite a bit in the past few months uh, in the way that uh, we look at European uh, health union and health in Europe uh, um, together. I think that uh, um, it will be important to move it forward because right now there's a lot of discussion. There has been like uh, a lot of positive reaction, a lot of positive initiatives uh, at European Parliament level or uh, at European Commission level. It was great to have uh, uh, President von der Leyen mentioning and having opening basically the State of the Union with, with healthcare at the center and to see all the proposals and to see how uh, the EU for Health program is uh, it's getting traction back again, also thanks to the work of the Parliament. I think. Uh, it's going to be very important to see what's next and how uh, we can really move the discussion forward from, uh, uh, let's say, a bit of wishful thinking on, on having more health at, at EU level to actually doing it in the way that we'll have to do it. It's, it's of course, yet to be defined. The Conference on Future of Europe is going to be fundamental on this, but at the same time, we really uh, uh, from the patient point of view, what we really want to see is that, of course, public health gets uh, uh, gets even more uh, more the center of the attention. Of course, uh, that uh, the patients and the civil society as a whole are, are better involved in in shaping what could be uh, the, the future vision of uh, of health care in the EU. But for sure, it's. It, it's positive so far to see the discussion, to see the resources and thinking that it's, uh, it's been put into this. OK, uh, Michele, thank you for that thought at the moment. I think we can now hear uh, yet again from uh, the World Health Organization talking about Europe and it uniting on this issue of health. We are very concerned and we're also trying to walk the talk here in Copenhagen that while the staff was reprofiled to work on COVID, we kept what we call a dual track health system response, as you say, cancer screening, but also cardiovascular diseases, still the number one killer in Europe, and many other chronic diseases as well. So absolutely, the key issue there is we have to protect our healthcare workers. When I speak to a number of ministers, they're very concerned that the doctors and the nurses in the hospitals are being burned out, and there is no reserve cadre of, uh, of healthcare workers. So it means we have to strengthen the primary health care. And there, both the COVID and the non-COVID diseases come together. A stronger primary health care system and put pressure away from the hospitals. Now, Christian, you've been um, today in Parliament announcing new money for uh, a health budget, essentially, for the EU. What, what have you come up with? Well, we just uh, voted in the MV committee and uh, I was the main rapporteur. Uh, I worked with an extremely extraordinary team, Sarah is one part of this team, but other colleagues also. To, uh, we voted you for health program, which is a robust program. Initially, it was intended to have 9.4 billion as a budget. 
Then after the negotiations between the heads of states and governments, uh, we come to 1.7 because from the next generation, no money to this program, to others. But comparing to the previous programs, around 400 million, it's four times bigger. And we ask for 9.4, and I'm sure that we will increase a little bit the budget of 1.7. But the most important are the robust objectives and the fact that we would like to concentrate to better prepare our healthcare systems, to become more resilient, to better prepare for future crises, to fight more effectively against cancer, to give some support to you beating cancer plan uh, initiative of European Commission from this program, to uh, support digitalization initiatives and to increase the digitalization of uh, the healthcare uh, and also also very important to fight against shortages of medicines. These are the main objectives and uh, we sent a very strong political signal today from European Parliament to citizens, to member states, to governments that would like to have uh, more uh, prerogatives and also more initiatives at the EU level and more coordination at the EU but, level in the health area. But, but, but isn't that the question, is, is that what citizens actually want? Yes. Um, but, but, but is All the polls shows that. <laughs> So, so, but many people would say that actually the people who have, or the countries that have dealt best with this health care crisis is health that is managed much more at a local level rather than a European level. All the polls, even before the crisis, showed that at least 60% of citizens would like to see European Union more involved, not to take all the responsibilities from the local or regional. Of course, this is something which is not feasible and they don't want this, but they want more involvement and more prerogatives. Health will remain mainly a national or local, regional uh, priority uh, and responsibility. But at the EU level, we can do more. And this is the message that people sent us, and this is what we are working now. OK. So let's bring you in on, um, actually, what Hans was talking about there in that clip, which was about other diseases and how they're being possibly forgotten. About. Everyone's been talking about cancer care and... and, and, and um, you know, the very fact that people die of heart attacks every single year and there are millions across Europe. Is that a concern of, of yours that coronavirus has almost consumed hospitals and medical uh, advice at the moment? Uh, yes, without a doubt, that is not only a concern of mine, but also from this parliament, from this house. And today, as Christian was saying, we voted this ambitious, the most ambitious health programme yet to see at the European level. And this we have two responses. First, to avoid that we have crises similar, that we are better prepared for new crises like COVID, but also to tackle the problems that COVID uh, put out in the open. And secondly, it is a program that is very much uh, tuned into the public health uh, uh, programs that can be done at EU level by all member states and also by regions and cities. This is to prevent disease, promote health and prolong life through the organised efforts of society. That is the public health definition and this programme delivers on that. Now we are going for uh, plenary votes and if it's accepted by this House as a whole, then we will start with Christian at its lead with the uh, negotiations with the Council. As we were saying, financing is quite important. We are not only talking talking here about being better prepared for COVID-19, but also, as you're mentioning, to be better prepared for other diseases and not forget also the health determinants and modifiable risk factors that we, we can tackle. If we tackle those risk factors, we are going to reduce the burden of disease at the level. So this is impressive, an impressive program that will have many health benefits, not only in the future at long term, but also short and medium term. Uh, now, Christian Bourgeau has uh, just had to pop off a uh, thing, but we're uh, going to come to Thomas Lav in a second. But I just want to bring in another poll that we carried out involving thousands of you at home, essentially asking about whether you think Europe is united in its strategy to combat coronavirus. Uh, again, uh, some of the big countries, of course, Europe, Germany, Italy and France uh, there. Interestingly, um, you know, Germany essentially coming out quite strongly suggesting that they uh, don't think that Europe is particularly united, 73% saying they don't think. Italians also uh, not convinced that Italy, uh, so that Europe is united. And of course, Ursula von der Leyen had to apologise to the Italian people on behalf of Europe uh, at the start of this crisis. 53% though were people in France saying uh, that they are uh, convinced that Europe is uh, united. Do you think, Thomas, that Europe's been united? 
I in think, the response. I think, you, I think Europe has done a lot. Uh, so so it, from, uh, it relaxed uh, the rules on that, which made it, made it possible for member states to, to gather funds to buy medical equipment. It also, it also provided uh, member states with medical equipment from its own, from its own resources again, through several, uh, uh, several pro programmes. Of course, the new, the new budget has been adopted by the Council. Now we are in the Parliament to determine, uh, to determine what happens next, but I think in the end it will, it will be adopted. Of, uh, the Commission already made agreements uh, with, uh, with, big, with big companies about the purchase of, uh, of uh, vaccines. So I think Europe has done, has done a lot, of course. It's, not, it's never optimal, it's never perfect, but I think it has done a lot. Unfortunately, in, in, if you, you, you can see that in different member states, some political groups use uh, this situation, unfortunately, to spread fake news and to, and to focus on help that has come from some third countries and blame everything on the European Union. But, I think, but if you look at the concrete situation, uh, when European Union stepped in, with its own measures, with its own help, to the, to the, especially to the member states which, which uh, suffered the most, the uh, things be, uh, be, became, uh, get, uh, started, started to improve. So I think definitely the European Union has a big role to play. We have now, hopefully, the, the big Europe, EU for Health program. We have the co cohesion policy, which can be used uh, to fund uh, health infrastructure and health workforces in the uh, less developed parts of the European Union. There's also one initiative that I've been working on, and that's joint purchase of expensive medicines and medical equipment which can uh, be used to bring down prices of medical equipment and medicines on the, uh, for, uh, on the European level. So I think definitely European Union, even though healthcare is a primary competence of the member states, when the European Union steps in and it has possibilities to step in, things are getting to, uh, starting to improve. And we have seen this with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic. OK, uh, Tomislav, we're going to pause there for a second because we're going to move on to the final part of this programme. Don't forget, we are going to be talking about all these issues and covering... Uh, what's been said today, along with lots more in that briefing newsletter on the Euronews website, you can sign up, euronews.com. But we're going to hear one final time uh, from the WHO about the future and about whether there is any light at the end of the tunnel, when potentially may life get back to normal in the midst of this coronavirus uh, crisis. And again, here's what Hans Kluge had to say to me a little bit earlier. Is it the silver bullet? Clearly, no way. I mean, first of all, some vaccines may only work in certain population groups. Some vaccines may require a cold chain by minus 80 degrees. So it will also be a huge logistical operation. It's very important. No, and, and WHO is doing a, a lot with the COVAX facility. But ultimately, we have to learn to live with the virus, whether it is this one or the next one. And that's also good news. A lot depends on us. Second, when... Well, uh, I wish I would know the, the answer. My careful estimate was always before mid of next year, there is an unprecedented collaboration and speeding up between public and private sector coordinated by the Global Alliance on the Vaccines and WHO. So I am carefully optimistic. I'm telling to the people of Europe, this is not the end of the world. We are close, so let's stick together for a couple of months more to get through, particularly as we don't want our elderly people with the flu season, with excess mortality on respiratory disease to pass away if we can keep them longer. So let's say that a couple of months more to stick together and we will get there. It's not the end of the world. Stick with the rules, essentially the message there from the World Health Organization. Well, let's bring back in uh, Mikael uh, Calabro, who is from the European uh, Patients Forum, has done the line for us. McKelly, um, do you think that uh, your patients essentially are listening uh, to that message about sticking to the rules? And how do they feel about a vaccine? Because, you know, there's lots of suggestions that many Europeans feel slightly uneasy about the prospect of a vaccine. So on uh, uh, on the first part, I think indeed uh, I can I can agree with with what Hans Kluge said. Uh, uh, it's uh, a solution to this crisis is uh, it's not just about the vaccine. It's about like uh, uh, you know a broader set of instruments that indeed needs to be uh, then then respected at the population level and also needs to be harmonized at the European level. Which I think indeed again uh, there's um, uh, there's a good positive way forward to this. In terms of uh, in terms of the vaccine, I think. Uh, uh, what we, we also, as the European Patients Forum recently called, we, we, we certainly appreciate, again, uh, as was mentioned by, by Hans Kluge, the, the, the efforts uh, made uh, um, at different levels to 
speed up the process and to make sure that uh, um, that the vaccine will arrive, uh, you know, as soon as possible. But at the same time, uh, and and linking to what you ask, I think uh, to to really uh, make sure that uh, there will be enough trust at population level uh, to tackle what we we know as uh, there's the issue with the vaccination, uh, with vaccine hesitancy that comes even before, you know, the COVID crisis. Uh, it, it will, will have to be sure that uh, patient safety and citizen safety will be put as the highest priority when, uh, uh, well, in the finalization of the vaccine, but also in the distribution and in the public health strategies that will be behind the distribution, uh, therefore identifying the, the categories of risk, uh, the prioritization. Uh, there will be, uh, it will be needed a lot of work to make sure the citizens really make sure, uh, understand how the, the vaccine will be important as part of the solution to the COVID COVID pandemic and also there will be enough transparency and reassurance to patients that uh, the vaccine themselves will be uh, developed and finalized following you know the highest standard is indeed a pressing issues but of course uh, safety will have to be put, uh, to be put at the center uh, especially to make sure that citizens and, 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 and patients as a whole will uh, uh, Will, will accept and will will use then uh, the vaccine alongside all the other public health measures that COVID um, is is making necessary at uh, at European and national level. Okay, Michele, thank you very much indeed for that. Let's just move on to a final poll before we bring in uh, our MEPs uh, for the last time. Well, we're actually asking about that vaccine uh, if the coronavirus vaccine becomes available uh, at no or little financial cost within the next year. Will you get yourself? vaccinated. Quite starkly, uh, while there are majorities, just about it must be said, in Germany, Italy and Great Britain, um, only 37% of people saying in France they will, 39% saying uh, no. And, you know, that's quite troubling, isn't it, Thomas Lav, to a degree that, you know, we're told that this vaccine is incredibly important if life is to get back to normal, but many Europeans don't feel terribly comfortable with it. Yes, unfortunately, a similar situation is in my country, in Croatia, where a recent poll showed that around 40% of the people won't get uh, vaccinated. I think that, that that's, a, that's a big problem. I think that we definitely, as politicians, have the responsibility to engage with people and explain them why it is important, but that, uh, that media has also a big role to play because, I mean, you, the internet as decentralized as it is, is really a breeding ground for all kinds of uh, theories, fake news, uh, uh, theories which have no basis in reality and science, etc. That's a big problem. Unfortunately, we also have some uh, uh, political groups in my, in my country. Unfortunately, they even have MEPs here in the parliament who, who are basing their whole political strategy on sp spreading fake news, uh, spreading uh, uh, misinformation about healthcare in general, about the role of vaccines, etc. So we definitely have responsibility as politicians, but you also, as media to, to talk to people to, and to explain them using real scientific data why this is necessary because this saves lives. Um, and so just very finally to you, but there is a possibly genuine concern because, you know, when you look back, not every vaccine, particularly ones that have been rushed out and uh, have been perfect. Um, so do you understand where that kind of angst or misgiving comes from when it comes to uh, vaccinations. And second of all, I mean, are you hopeful that, I don't know, by next spring, this time next year, life will be back to normal? <laughs> uh, I'll start with the second question. Uh, I don't think uh, we will be back to the old normal by next spring. And following with the answer to the first question, uh, it's quite uh, understandable that there is some hesitancy in a new vaccine. There's not a perfect vaccine for any disease whatsoever. What we have is that we have vaccines in the market that are quite safe and that have high standards of vaccine quality and safety. And this is only the case when a medicine, and in this case vaccine, comes to the market. And this is something that the EU won't overstep or overcome um, or, or accelerate the safety procedures. And this is important to, to convey because this is what brings persons to be more hesitant in a new vaccine that we don't know the, the biochemical pr uh, profile of that vaccine that also needs to be understood. But uh, this is an information that we need to have as 
politicians as media, but scientists provide them a platform to explain to the citizens what are the scientific bases for uh, a vaccine. I don't want my prime minister to tell me to go vaccinate. I would want the lead head scientist of Portugal to tell me to vaccinate with sound scientific data. D this interconnection between science, politics and media, it's quite important for this. As far as the next vaccine, when we have a vaccine, if that happens, uh, there will be a time where we need to define who are the people who are going to get the vaccine first, how are these immunization going to happen, and this will take months. What we ask now, already as a parliament, is to the commission to come up with a coordinated plan on how are we going to immunize uh, the people, even though we don't have the chemical, biochemical profile of such vaccine. OK, uh, so there we go. Some advice on vaccinations and... Um... I think we had a kind of mixed message that there might be light at the end of the tunnel, but don't expect life to get back to normal by <laughs> next spring. OK, well, that is all we've got time for uh, for this afternoon. Thank you very much to all our guests today, to Sarah Shadesh uh, from uh, the S&D, from uh, Tomislav Sokol from uh, the EPP. Also, thank you to Mikhail uh, Calabro, who joined us down the line there with the uh, European Patients Forum. Thank you very much indeed, Nat. And to our other guests, uh, Christian uh, Bourgeau, who was, uh, had to leave a little bit earlier, and Thomas Alvin, who uh, didn't make it on the programme in the end. Some gremlins got in the system and we couldn't get him on air, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure we'll get his views out there somehow. Thank you too to you uh, for watching. There'll be continuing coverage of the coronavirus crisis uh, on Euronews throughout the days and weeks to come. And don't forget, uh, you can and you probably should subscribe to our uh, newsletter. It launches officially tomorrow at 6pm. Sign up before that on Euronews.com. It's called The Briefing. Uh, I'm in charge of it. It's a good read. Get involved. Thank you all. Have a good, good afternoon and we'll speak to you soon.